Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy spring. Thank you all for coming to um, the annual and my third State of the School Address. We're really, really happy for you all to be here today. Um, I want to acknowledge that in addition to those of you who have been here for some time, I noticed that there are parents who have eighth graders in the room. Uh, we also have a number of newly admitted uh, families here. So if you're new to that, you can just put your hand up. We're really, really excited for you to have joined our community, and this is one of many opportunities for learning and engagement. Uh, I had the good fortune last week of serving on an accreditation visit for another uh, independent school in Manhattan that is also progressive. And um, for those of you who don't know, NYSE, which is the New York State Association of Independent Schools, is the accrediting body. And every 10 years, schools go through a really rigorous self-study that, that, that uh, culminates with a four-day site visit from a team of visiting uh, educators and quote-unquote experts. Um, and among the many things that I learned during four days in another school and looking underneath the hood of somebody else's institution is that, uh, is that the business of schooling is, is complex and dynamic and, um, and that we are not alone in the many challenges and opportunities that we face here at Bank Street. I was also reminded that Bank Street is really, really good at the things that matter the most, which is teaching and learning and, and, and caring for children. Um, and lastly, I learned that it's a lot easier to be smart in somebody else's school. <laughs> um, we also had the good fortune of last night uh, having our first admissions open house, believe it or not, for the fall of 2020. Uh, and we've adapted the format and, and so that we are inviting families to come tour during the day as opposed to an empty building in the evening. And so we do a panel of students and alumni, and one of the things that one of our alums said last night in response to a question about how do you pivot from Bank Street to a real school, to maybe a more traditional school, um, was, uh, was that every child has their inner Bank Street, and it's just that some schools bring it out more than others. I thought that was a really powerful point that Zoe made. Last year, I... I um, I said that one of the great benefits of developing a strategic plan was that it would provide a framework for subsequent, subsequent state of the school addresses. And you'll see today that we're making good on that promise. But there was also something that I didn't say last year, which is um, that this was really a ploy for me to distribute the, the bur burden, I mean joy, of giving the state of the school address. Um, and so what you'll see, you know, it's giving a 75 minute presentation to a group of eager Bank Street parents is, is something that's going to happen across the leadership team tonight, today. So um, today I'll be joined by colleagues who will each self-introduce um, during their portion of the address. And I'm really grateful for their efforts in preparing for today. Okay, so I wanted to, uh, to just bring us back to our origins. Um, for those of you who haven't heard Lucy Sprague Mitchell's name enough, she was our founder, uh, 1916. And among the many things that uh, informed the founding of our school, she summoned us to, um, she, she implored us to summon the courage to work, unafraid and efficiently, in a world of new ideas, new challenges, sorry, new problems and, and, and new needs. And so, what, what we are going to do today, to begin with, is to give you an update on uh, year one of our strategic plan. And um, this year has really been a self-study to establish the baseline in, in order to determine where we are going to head. And um, so we're going to go through the different elements of the strategic plan. And I think Lucy's quote is a really important thing to keep in mind, which is that it's really important to stay true to who we are, but also to be willing and courageous in facing uh, the, the realities of the day. So I wanna just tell you a quick story, and then we're gonna get started. But when I was in, in uh, high school, I had the good fortune of being uh, part of an organization called Amigos de las Americas, which some of you may know, sort of like an abbreviated Peace Corps for 
uh, for younger people to go to places that in the developing world to provide some kind of service. And um, it's complicated on many levels, sort of, which I, which I won't get into. But my assignment was to go to Costa Rica to teach dental hygiene to um, kids in really rural villages who had never brushed their teeth. And how many of you remember as kids eating those little red pills? and like to see where the plaque was on your teeth. You remember that? It's nasty. Um, so imagine that, so we were sponsored by Colgate, Colgate. And uh, we literally went in these mobile medical units to these really rural communities and we're giving out toothbrushes and toothpaste. And the first thing that we were supposed to do is have the kids eat, chew on those red pills. And so it was like fireworks. Their, their mouths were just lighting up because, of course, there was a lot of plaque on their teeth. So we gave a nice little talk about importance of dental hygiene, gave every kid a, a toothbrush and a toothpaste, and then left. Um, how impactful do you think that was? Not much. So I, I um, even at the, the young age of 17, realized that, um, that uh, sometimes thinking outside the box is, is more effective than, than following the, the playbook. And, um, and so the next summer, a friend of mine and I decided to go back there, not with amigos, but actually to try to figure out what was the root cause and not to just try to treat the symptom. And so what we decided to do was figure out why dental hygiene was such a problem. And it turned out that in Costa Rica, there was a tradition that, um, that mothers would infuse the milk that they gave their babies with sugar. Um, because they thought that the babies would like it more. And that was a tradition that had been passed down for many generations. So we decided that instead of, um, instead of trying to treat the children, that we're, what we really needed to do was work with the parents. So we went back the next summer and went to, to that um, clinics, the medical clinics, and, and ran workshops for expecting mothers about the importance of good um, nutrition for their children. It felt like a much more impactful approach. So I tell that story because it's relevant to the way that we're thinking about the strategic plan, which is that we want to identify what the root issues are in order not just to treat the symptoms. And so, um, as I said, the first year has really been about, about self-study, establishing the baseline. Um, we have emailed out on numerous occasions um, It, it was a hyperlink on your many invitations, the written version of the strategic plan. We chose not to print them out today because next week is Earth Week and the Green Action Committee is very active right now, so we're not <laughs> wasting lots of paper. Um, um, but you all should have access to it. It's on the website and it's, it's the framework from which we are um, reporting this morning. So, um, I wanted to just give you the, the kind of visual summary of the strategic plan that was developed over the course of 18 months with lots of community input and engagement. And what you'll see is that at the core of our plan is a commitment to diversity, equity, and social justice, which lives in all of the priorities, um, but also warrants mention unto itself. And then the outer ring is community engagement, parents and alumni who uh, are essential to the core of what happens in our school. And then we've broken the strategic plan into three areas that begin with C, and then uh, five strategic priorities. So the three areas are children, culture, and curriculum. And in the children section, which we'll begin with, is um, it, the, the strategic priorities around student support and differentiated instruction. Then in the culture section, um, we, set, we set two goals. One was around a shared behavioral framework that would cohere the way that we think about culture. Um, and then also, of course, the most important resource in any school is, is our extraordinary faculty. So making sure that we're also giving them life and opportunities for growth. And then the third area is curriculum. And we have two different um, priorities within the curriculum section. One is around aligning and cohering both within and across grade levels. And the other is a focus on STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our first colleague, Koi, who will share updates on diversity and equity. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. But that wasn't loud enough. Come on now, it's Thursday morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, boys. Good morning, 
I'm Coy Daly, Director of Diversity and Equity here, and it's my pleasure and honor to stand in front of you and share what we're doing. Um, so some quick updates. Um, in living our mission, um, we always think about how do we make our community more inclusive? How do we make sure everyone feels that this is their space? So one new update that you will see in your family handbook this summer, because I know you love reading it every summer, um, you will learn about our gender diversity policy and statement about how we affirm people in our community, no matter how they identify in terms of their gender. This um, policy has been the work here for the past few years, well, since, since I've got here, we've been in discussions, and finally was approved by Cabinet, which is the overall governing body of all of Bank Street. Um, and it will be adopted by Bank Street College, so it's a big shift. We also have an updated hiring protocol. We think of, we want our community of faculty and staff to reflect our student body. Um, and we want people to see themselves in this space, so we really are mindful of how we approach hiring. So there's a new protocol that we follow to do that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, there is a parent advisory board that exists. Some of you in this room are on that board, but I know there are people who don't know about it. But this board is a group of volunteers who meet with me to plan um, a, a parent education opportunities, um, things that parents are seeking to learn more about or engage about as they connect with our community. Uh, we're in conversations about shifting maybe the name and the focus of this this group. Um, and, there, and you'll hear more updates about it, but we're thinking about parent accountability in terms of accountability of how we, as a parent body, are impacted by the strategic plan. What is the parent role in that strategic plan and what opportunities exist for um, education so that we're all aligned, school and home. Um, so more about that. You will hear open call to join. In the next few weeks, I'll send something out in the backpack and through the PA about um, if you want to join, just sign up, let us know, and I'll keep you informed of the meetings. Um, also new this year, we have a formation of an upper school GSA, a Gender and Sexuality Alliance. You're going to hear much more about that later on in this presentation, but that's something new that's been in the works for a few years. And finally, and students generate an interest in creating this, and that's how this, we, we know this will be sustained, because it's student generated. Um, and finally, I want to mention about college-wide connections. Um, there's, just so you know, Bank Street College has also a strategic plan that we've been in in the past few years. And one of the biggest areas has been about social justice and equity and how to and actually engage the whole community of Bank Street in those conversations. So one part of that is the Social Justice and Equity Committee, which is a group of volunteers from all over the institution who meet monthly to have conversations about identity. Um, and those conversations focus on uh, raising racial literacy and the examination of intersectionality. And so these are some really challenging conversations, but the work is to expand our capacity across this whole institution to actually live our values in terms of social justice and equity. So I wanted to mention that it's not just the School for Children that's committed to this work, but there's a bigger push across the whole institution to really live our mission in Credo. So just wanted to update you on that. You're wondering, how do teachers keep growing? What do we do internally that you don't know about? So, there's a confronting bias hiring workshop, and that's connected to the new hiring protocol because we notice that we all have implicit bias. We may know about some of our biases, but a lot of them we don't know. And so, to address that in the hiring process and thinking about being gatekeepers of who comes in, we have a workshop that's focused on addressing that. That's new, that's coupled with the new hiring protocol. The language values workshop, which I know some of you couldn't make it in the fall, and we wanted to be here so badly. So we're going to keep offering that every year. Uh, it's all new faculty and staff are required to go through it as part of the orientation. It will be part of new family orientation. And we're talking about how to rope it in into the divisional transitional meeting. So everyone can learn how we use language here at Bank Street. But that's something that we are committed to in thinking about affirming our community members and thinking about the language we use. We require all our new faculty and staff to go through an undoing racism workshop. It's a two and a half day in, um, intense experience to understand the history of our country in terms of race and racism. And that's our framework of thinking about social justice here at Bank Street. So that's a workshop that all faculty have gone through who are already here and we keep offering that because to build that collective understanding and knowledge as we move forward into our work. And finally, some more learning that we do. The top three books are the summer reading books that faculty and staff um, nominated and voted on last year. And we do this, this started, well, since I've been here, we've done this every year. But we always have book recommendations, and we decide, choose which books we're going to read. Um, and we're going to continue this trend um, throughout, because if we're increasing our capacity as adults here, and learning, I mean, think about 
model that we're doing with our students. So something we're always engaged in, trying to be better at what we do. And one thing that's been interesting is that Children's Le Program Leadership has been reading White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And that's been fascinating in terms of conversations uh, and showing a commitment of that if the leadership team is willing to have these deep conversations about how we're trying to hold our whole institution accountable to what we do. That's all I got. <laughs> well, have a good day. Okay, so I'm back. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier, so I'm a bad role model. I'm Jack Dippert, I'm the Dean of Children's Programs, and you do that in the school. Um, so uh, the next is around the outer ring, which is community engagement, and I wanted to talk a little bit about parenting engagement opportunities from this year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, our psychologists run a series of roughly monthly, every six weeks, um, child development meetings in the mornings around topics of interest to the community. And so what you'll see on the left-hand side was a slate of topics that existed this year. Um, and uh, we really have been pleased with the turnout, and we're always happy to add to the mix if people have ideas that they would like to convene around. Um, and Charlie will also be talking about the uh, initiation of a new initiative around technology-specific talks and impact with parenting. And then on the right-hand side of this slide, what you'll see is um, the various evening forums that we have sponsored this year with the goal of engaging the community in opportunities for learning. Um, so starting all the way back in the first week of school, we had the author of a book called Positive Discipline. Um, Carla Shalaby came in as the Niemeyer lecturer um, for the college, who's the author of the book that Cord just mentioned. Um, we had a speaker who wrote a book about the marriage equality movement and how it's affected other social movements. Michael Thompson, who's a preeminent scholar on the life of boys. Um, Sian Baylock, who uh, is the president of Barnard and also a Bank Street parent, talked about performing under pressure. Lenore Scanese uh, came and gave a talk about her approach to parenting. And then we always do a wonderful alumni panel in the, uh, in the winter months where we bring back alumni from a range of grades who talk about their life trajectories and how banks should inform them. And I just want to say, not as a gotcha, but as an as a opportunity that attendance at these forums w was low this year. And we, we really do hope that, um, that we can see more people show up because every single time we bring people in, those who attend have a very uh, instructive, informative, sometimes transformative experience. And, um, and more people benefiting from that would be great. Uh, and then there's other kinds of parent engagement opportunities. Um, you can see there are, if there's a will, there's a way at Bank Street. Um, Coy mentioned uh, some of the work, well, so we, we have parent affinity groups in addition to student affinity groups. And then you can just see a whole slew of different ways that parents can volunteer um, as members of this community. And I, I just want to put in a plug that there are still some vacant positions for next year's Parent Association Executive Board, which is a really great opportunity to get close to the, the uh, inner workings of the school, meet both in divisions and as well as with me on a monthly basis. So for those of you who have interest, we would love for you to reach out to our wonderful PA co-chairs, Rachel and Maria. Kristen Worrell, and I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Relations. As a, as a K through eight school, we know how difficult it is to bring people back. And so we know that your colleges are calling for you, your high schools are get, trying to get at you, but every alum that I've ever spoken to has always said that Bank Street holds a very special place in their hearts. So as a result, we got together and we officially formed the Bank Street Alumni Association this year, which launched in December of 2018. We have our first alumni president. His name is Eric Wynn, and he's the class of 1958. We are currently trying to establish a governing body. So if there are any alumni in the room who are interested and want to get involved, please find me later. Um, but. Uh, we have a number of subcommittees, which you can also get involved in. One is the reunion committee. 
the class chair committee, which helps us <coughs> for outreach, and we're trying to find all of our alumni. Um, we have an archive committee because everyone has great stories, everyone has great photos, people have great yearbooks that we don't always have, so we're trying to put everything in one place. And we're also conducting outreach to find alums for whom we may have lost along the way. Um, currently, we meet monthly. We are holding our all-class reunion this year on June 8th. And this year's reunion will be a little different from in the past. We're holding an experiential class for alums to come back and sort of remember what it's like to be a Bank Street student. So maybe they'll do some math or some other things. Um, we're also holding a change maker panel this year, which we're putting together our panelists. And we have a great roster of alumni who are interested in getting involved. And we'll end it with a cocktail reception. That's what everyone comes for. Right? <laughs> But that's not the only way that we are engaging our alumni. So we actually have an alumni Facebook page. We are starting an alumni newsletter, which will go out quarterly, which will have class notes. We'll talk about everything that happens at Bank Street. We invite our alumni back to Bank Street events. And we just started, because of course we have to get into the new age, but we just started our um, first Bank Street alumni Instagram page, which I'm a little obsessed with, and every time our followers go up, I'm really happy. So we're currently at 115 followers, and we put up all sorts of things. So we put out an ad for our change maker panel, we put up old photos from our yearbooks, and alumni seem to enjoy it. So they, I mean, I think one of our photos, we had about 30 comments of people remembering the good times that they had at Bank Street. So we're really reaching out and trying to find lots of different ways to engage our alumni, which has been great so far. Thank you. Hi. I'm Sara Majori, and um, I'm the Upper School Learning Specialist and the Student Support Team Leader this year. And I just wanted to share with you some of the work we've done around student support and differentiated instruction. Um, oops, that went the wrong way. All right. Um, so one of the exciting things that's happened in the past several years is our learning support team has grown to four full-time learning specialists. And having a larger team allows us to really collaborate and think about how we can best support student learning. Um, so across divisions, one primary mode of support we have is through consultancy. And what that looks like is on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, learning specialists and school psychologists meet with teaching teams. And we discuss issues related to student work, student behavior, student development, um, and any ways that we can really make sure we understand what's going on in the classroom, are familiar with the growth of every student, um, and can collaborate to better come up with interventions and plans. Um, we also have increased our efforts at adding direct support in the classroom. Um, so again, having four learning specialists makes it possible for us to do more push-in work, um, do some small group pull-out work at targeted skills, um, and it allows us to be more integrated in the community um, and be a more uh, active part of the students' experience at Bank Street. Um, so one of the efforts towards integration of learning support has really been um, making the learning specialists visible. Um, that could look like running affinity groups, it could look like chaperoning field trips, um, and just being another adult in the <coughs> child's world, um, so that children feel like learning support is not a stigma. In fact, it's something they have another adult that they can seek uh, support from. Um, and lastly, we are able to collaborate with not only each other, which again, has been great with having four people, um, but also with our colleagues in the graduate school and with outside providers. Um, and with families, so we can leverage all, all the supports in the students' world um, so that we can really uh, celebrate and promote student learning. Um, as part of the strategic plan, there's been a significant investment in learning support. So um, our learning support team, we have been able to meet and identify areas where we would like to grow as individuals and as professionals. Um, and we've been lucky enough to attend numerous professional developments. And one of the things that we really made an active effort to do is to make sure that when we do professional development, 
Um, we do it across divisions. So it would be um, having the lower school learning specialist and middle school specialist trained in the same types of things. Um, so that we have a consistent language and we can integrate consistent strategies um, across the developmental trajectory. Uh, one of the strengths of our program is that we're really free to adapt to the needs of every individual child. Um, so increasing the tools that we have really helps us um, build more capacity within our teachers and within ourselves so that we can provide students with the best possible experience. Um, the other big celebration that we have in terms of learning support and differentiated instruction is uh, we formally had a diagnostic committee that we rebranded as the student support team. Um, and the function of this team is a monthly meeting that provides a forum for looking at student work, looking at data, um, and examining the experience of various students and thinking about how to best leverage all of our group expertise to support the students. So as you can see on the slide, we have a number of people that are across divisions that participate in these meetings. And on one prong, we talk about individual students and we come up with plans of prevention, intervention, support, and transition. Um, and on the other hand, we examine and revisit policies and we are able to share across division what we're seeing and think about how we can work together as a team um, to improve the learning of all students. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm Gabby Shatton. I'm the lower and middle school psychologist. I'm Lori Slodovnik. I'm the psychologist for grades four through eight. Okay. As part of our ongoing work to promote a positive school culture, we are examining and clarifying our values as a community. We aim to articulate a shared vision of how we want our school to feel and which norms we want our community members to uphold. We envision our community to be one in which we all, students, teachers, and parents, feel safe to explore, feel, learn, and grow. As such, we aim to show respect for and sensitivity to the needs and feelings of others, act in ways that promote safety for others and ourselves, show respect for learning, show respect for our environment, and see mistakes as integral to learning. So what does this look like in practice? Um, we strive to practice all these values in how, when, how we teach and in the spaces we create for connection and collaboration. They're embodied in our curricula, some of which are listed over there on the student side. Um, our curricula that uh, explore identity, inclusion, equity, and justice and permeate all three of our divisions. They are the reason that we place close listening, both to ourselves and to each other, at the center of our process. Indeed, our focus on inquiry-based learning, collaborative group work, and social action all grow out of our communal values. These values also underlie our long-standing commitment to providing a variety of spaces for students, faculty, and parents to feel seen, heard, and connected. You'll hear more about specific curricula and programming later in the presentation, but we'll describe a few with which we are directly involved. Banana Splits, which is one of our many affinity groups for students, is a program of regular meetings for children whose lives have been touched by parental separation or divorce. In the middle school, these meetings occur monthly and are facilitated by Gabby, Laura Guarino, our associate dean, and Priya Desai, our psychology intern. In the upper school, I co-lead bi-monthly meetings of Banana Splits with Jessica Block, a Times 11 humanities teacher. For children in the lower and middle schools, we offer as needed a variety of small groups to expand social connection and strengthen pro-social skills. A couple, we give them names, so lunch bunch is one, board game groups, triangle groups, you know, it depends, it's responsive to whatever the issues are that we're trying to support. Um, in a more formal way, in the 6-7s and the 7s-8s, Eve Selver Cassell, who's one of the middle school learning specialists, and I have collaborated to give social thinking lessons to those students. Um, and the main goal here is to create a common language that's actually not just used by the students, but by the teachers and us, um, that 
shares language and concepts about what it means to be a good community member, what it means to be a good friend and an effective work partner because there's so much collaboration that the kids are doing, we want them to be successful. So those kids are now, what, in fourth grade, I think, fourth grade. but this is a while ago. <laughs> and those are their super social, social thinking personas, right? Social. They're, they're um, super flexible superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. logo was designed. Right. We thought it was a good symbol for moving forward. Um, so, you know, even in the most positive school communities, those with well articulated values and well established shared norms, there are inevitable instances of transgressive behavior. We know that children are often the canaries in the coal mine, so to speak. Their behaviors can give voice to the unspoken tensions within their families their school communities, and the world at large, which, as we all know, the world in particular is feeling quite tumultuous these days. We therefore choose to respond to any such behaviors with curiosity and empathy. As a school, we're committed to taking the whole child into account. That's probably something you hear a lot. Um, and as such, we must acknowledge and hold the tension between the need for predictable consequences and the need for differentiated responses tailored to each child as an individual. So we are analyzing the ways in which we have responded to a variety of situations, both currently and historically, with the goal of clarifying our behavioral expectations, a range of appropriate responses and consequences, and codifying communication protocols. So to start with, in the service of this goal, we examined as a whole faculty uh, the codes of conduct of eight independent schools in the New York City area. Um, and we were struck by the fact that though those codes ranged in specificity and flexibility, none of the schools reported markedly less behavioral transgressions than any of the other ones. In fact, when Jed spoke with the heads of those schools about their practice, they all said some version of, wow, when you figure this out, please let us know. <laughs> Um, so, we reached out to Dr. Jonathan Cohen of the National School Climate Center at Teachers College. He also happens to be a Bank Street uh, School for Children alum, which is nice. Um, and we began what we expect will be an ongoing conversation about how to establish a school community within which all participants, students, staff, and parents feel a true sense of membership and thereby an obligation to uphold our communal norms. In true Bank Street fashion, one of the first steps we are planning to take will be engaging in action research with our students to learn about what their experiences are within the community. Thank you. So the next strategic priority that we're going to talk about is faculty support and development. And I wanted to just share um, <laughs> uh, that was on Spirit Day. It was a, a non-competitive trivia contest among the upper school faculty. Um, so I wanted to just share some of the work that we're doing in terms of uh, faculty support and development. Um, one thing that, that is really worthy of note is that uh, three years ago, and each year it gets better, uh, four of our um, senior master teachers, uh, Maria Risha, Ryan Herity, Becky Eisenberg, and Karen Sylvie Depoff um, are uh, the leaders of a new faculty cohort. So they, before all of the faculty return in the summer, they have a day of really important orientation where they learn about the Bank Street culture and go through immersive experiences that help them understand who we are, as well as to form a, a, a cohort that really persists throughout the year. They also um, meet monthly in specific targeted support settings and then there's informal mentoring that happens as well. Uh, this year we implemented a system of differentiated supervision where um, prior to this year really our, the way that we, we supervise teachers was one size kind of fits all and what we realized is that folks who are on the early end of their career trajectories need a different level of support and so they, they receive more classroom observations whereas folks who have been at it for a while already have a good sense of their, their own needs as educators, and so they're, they're much more um, able to craft a support plan that really uh, speaks to areas of their own professional growth. In February, we, uh, we took our February Professional Development Day 
to um, allow teachers to get out of Bank Street and go visit other schools. So on February 15th, our teachers went to more than 30 different schools in and around New York City, uh, both to look at areas of their own practice that they've identified as part of their own goal setting, but also to really focus on the areas of our strategic plan that we wanted to get intel about and from other institutions, and that was a really important um, day for us. Critical Friends Groups are a, a version of professional learning communities where teachers from across grade levels come together periodically. We just did it yesterday, uh, and individual teachers bring either their own work or student work around which they have questions for consideration and, um, and collaboration with colleagues from across the, the, the school. So one, it builds community between the division, among the divisions, but also really helps both the presenter and the participants to, to expand their thinking about practice. Um, a long-standing tradition at Bank Street is summer curriculum grants where teachers can apply to either uh, further develop existing curriculum for documentation purposes or develop new curriculum. And we've also introduced this uh, in, in recent years, but really ramping this up this year, targeted institutes around aspects of our strategic plan. So to build upon what Gabby and Lori were saying, this summer we are going to have a, a three-day institute around restorative practices that's come from the restorative justice framework, led by an expert from the Inter uh, International Institute for Restorative Practices as part of our efforts to move forward in, uh, in positive school culture. Our teachers are coveted presenters at local and national conferences. It's a big opportunity for them to um, develop workshops and, and spread their genius to other educators. And then um, one of the benefits of being part of the college is that we have uh, a sabbatical program for teachers to re re rejuvenate and, uh, and really go deep on a problem or question of their own interest um, every 10 years. So I'm gonna take a quick moment to show uh, I really want to thank all of you because at the at the benefit this spring, um, our focus for for the grant a wish um, was to raise additional funds to provide learning opportunities for teachers, and um, thanks largely to Ian Khan's masterful uh, uh, wrangling, um, we, uh, we were able to raise about fifty-eight thousand dollars in about fifteen minutes. It was the least painful uh, uh, path raise that I've been part of. And I, I wanted to show this again, um, just because it's a really power, powerful video. Actually, I'm not going to, because, yes, I am. <laughs> so good. best 
which I think is really good. What are some exciting ways you've been able to show your passion uh, towards social justice at Bank Street? Shayler uh, showed us this film for Indigenous Peoples Day, or as it was recognized before, Columbus Day. Like, it was a lo bunch of Native Americans speaking about their story about Columbus Day. <laughs> so we were like, we have to do something. We proposed that Bank Street would not recognize Columbus Day as Columbus Day, but more as Indigenous Peoples Day. And so we went, we did that. And like, it was a very long process, but at the end, like you can check now, it is not Columbus Day, it is Indigenous Peoples Day in our calendar. I on students every day when my colleagues come back from professional development. I've seen it firsthand how much it helps the kids' classroom experience and how much joy the kids get out of learning. The wonderful thing of attending this conference is that we come back and we infuse that within each other, within the colleagues, we infuse that in the learning we do with children and the teaching we do with children. It's a bridge between this world and the world outside of our street. I have been taking this course on Tuesday evenings from October through March, and it's been really, really useful and fantastic. I mean, I have been able to directly take what I'm doing in that course and implement it into my classroom. I know of colleagues that have chosen where they're going to work and have negotiated contracts based on whether or not they are guaranteed being able to go to POCC because it's such an important part of their feeling and sense of belonging and the investment that their school makes in them as an educator of color. And so that's been really neat even this year to see how that investment in professional development has had a ripple effect on our students. I was born in Mazatenango, Guatemala. I had what's called an international adoption. My mom, a Northern Irish woman who lived in New York, brought me back from Guatemala when I was four months old. My mom and I flew into the good old Houston, Texas airport, and the captain came on as usual. He said, we have just landed in Houston, Texas airport. It's three o'clock and 3,000 degrees, and we've got beautiful skies and huge meal portions and an awesome space center. <laughs> but what he actually said next was beautiful. He said, I'm very happy to announce the five babies on board who have just become American citizens. Because as, a, as soon as the wheels touched the ground, I became an American citizen. To be honest, I don't know much about my family, but at least I know some stuff. I had a mom named Vidalia. She lived in a village and had some kids already, but she didn't have a lot of money. So when I came along, she knew that if I stayed with her, A, she couldn't take care of me, and B, I was destined to have a life that she couldn't really provide for me. So she did one of the most selfless things a human could do. She put me up for adoption so I could have that life I couldn't have with her. I've embraced my adoption, but sometimes adoption can be like my ghost that haunts me. It's easy to forget how privileged we are, especially everyone in this room, that Bank Street isn't just an education, it's a gift. The fact that I'm standing here right now, in New York City, it's some kind of miracle. The fact that my mother gave up her child for this chance, gave up me, has taught me to never take any kind of opportunity for granted. Even though a lot of you never had this kind of story, I encourage you to take a step back every once in a while to recognize that you are a lucky person too. Just remember that Bank Street is probably like the best thing ever. And that is a gift in itself. Parents, it's a very important. I believe that your money will help us to help kids develop as powerful humans, give them a voice, give them a space. And I believe that what you do for us will help us and help your children in the long run as well. Girl's gonna change the world. <laughs> Forgot to bring the tissue. So. <laughs> um, anyway, that that so that helped us raise a lot more money. For, for <laughs> So thank you for that. Um, the other, the other thing I want to say is 
Um, we're really, really grateful to the class of 2019. They have dedicated their class gift efforts towards um, renovating the faculty lounge on the C level, which is uh, not nice right now. <laughs> it's one of the areas of the building that was not renovated and is in desperate need of a makeover. And because of the generosity of the class of 19, uh, this is the rendering done by a Bank Street parent who's an architect, and we'll be doing this this summer, and it will really be conducive to um, collaboration and just taking a break um, from your children. <laughs> and mine. that um, as we can tell from that film, your children are sort of the living, breathing examples of our curriculum. It's what we hear at our open houses all the time. Um, I'm going to start by saying that it is our hope that our curriculum is designed that whether your children are in the three fours or up through the 13s, 14s, that it is a regular part of their day that they experience the kind of curiosity and sense of wonder that this um, lower school student is exhibiting as she's learning about how pasta is made. Uh, in a progressive school, you probably all know this, it's one of the reasons you chose Bank Street. Curriculum is everything that happens both within and beyond the walls of this school community. It's shaped by the classroom community and by world events. It's reflected in the relationships that form between children and their teachers and the relationships between each other and the partnerships that happen between the families and the school community. Curriculum lives in the materials that the children use, the field trips they take, and of course the subject content area that they study and the ideas that they wrestle with. Our approach is called developmental interaction because we think carefully about what children are capable of understanding when we choose what to study at each age level. We move from the concrete nature of the here and now to the more abstract concepts of long ago and far away. In every grade, whenever possible, Children will actively explore concepts by engaging in first-hand experiences. Our approach often involves a combination of what we call fixed and emergent curriculum. Fixed being the roadmap or the curriculum plan. Emergent is what we call the journeys off the path based on children's interests or questions. A lower school example might be when a child is on the deck and they notice water <coughs> dripping from a tank in one of the buildings nearby. A curriculum is, is born or the example that you just heard about, a group of children who have questions after they've done a study about um, Columbus Day and, and should it be named something different, or an upper school class studying the Weimar Republic that spends time on the conversation of are, good, are people inherently good or bad. In general, we prioritize depth over breadth, but always we cover the content necessary for children to have a full understanding of the topics we're covering. We emphasize inquiry, critical thinking, engagement, appropriate challenge, exploration and mistake making, child-centered learning, and culminating projects that represent the meaning making that has transpired. Creating or revising curriculum is a dynamic and ongoing process and there are many voices involved. Teachers, division heads, the math science coordinator, the math and literacy specialists, learning specialists, psychologists, and the directors of diversity and technology all have the opportunity to review content through their lens and give feedback as appropriate. The leadership committee reviews new curriculum proposals and selects domains for rotational review each year. Ultimately, the division heads are responsible for the content and cohesion of the curriculum within their divisions. Curriculum documentation. We document curriculum in the following ways. At the beginning of each school year, on curriculum night, each division shares with parents age-level curriculum statements that outline the fixed curriculum in every area for each grade. Throughout the year, teachers also use weekly classroom updates to share information about ongoing curriculum and classroom life in action. Every year, teachers have the opportunity to apply for summer curriculum grants, which are awarded and selected, sorry, awarded to selected applicants for the purpose of creating, augmenting, or aligning curriculum within an age group, group or domain. These documents become part of the School for Children curriculum resources. And as part of the strategic planning process, we have reinvigorated our curricular review, and we are asking ourselves these framing questions as we think about curriculum. Whose story is being told? What are the guaranteed core curricular experiences each child should have at each grade level as part of a Bank Street education? 
and what are the social, emotional, academic, and practical skills that children need to develop in order to be successful as they move out into the world beyond Bank Street. Developing, reviewing, and aligning curriculum. This process can take several months or several years. The process itself includes first starting with an inventory of what currently exists, including gaps and redundancies, then a review of the literature and the latest theories of practice. Engagement with stakeholders, which can include children, teachers, and sometimes parents. This is the step that can take the most amount of time, given how important stakeholder buy-in is to all aspects of our teaching practice. And then we articulate a framework for the work that needs to be done, including specific goals and a time frame for deliverables. Creation or revision of the curriculum content including includes the consideration of these things. A rationale, implications for practice, alignment within an age group or domain or between divisions, and even the impact between domains, given that we have an integrated approach to curriculum. For example, a change in social studies will trigger a change in some as aspect of that grade's art curriculum. Recommendations for faculty supports in the form of additional resources and training are at the end, and then we're ready to launch. Soon to be followed by review and refine in collaboration with stakeholders and in response to the lived curricular experience. Curriculum at Bank Street is ongoing and living. So I want to end with some examples of work we've been doing in the recent past, and we'll start with uh, work at the age group level, classroom level. This year, the 8s and 9s developed a new social studies curriculum that reflects a strength-based study of African culture. We are currently considering a 9s, 10 Spanish proposal that would take one of their two 40-minute periods per week and turn it into several shorter 20-minute targeted language-rich experiences during times such as morning meetings, snack, or during a, during a movement break. In the realm of cross-divisional or do domain reviews, based on a combination of parental interest and the increase in the number of middle school classrooms based on the expansion, we're reviewing the scope and sequence of the drama program. Over the last several years, we have done two school-wide curriculum audits. We did one in diversity, identity development, and social justice, and more recently, the human growth and development curriculum. As you're going to hear later from the division updates, some of the outcomes of this work include changes in the way the lower school observes Martin Luther King Day and their study of change makers, and the development of a scope and sequence for the upper school health and wellness curriculum that will be taking place during community time. This year, as part of the strategic plan, we focused on early literacy curriculum which Emily Shotland, our second to, sorry, kindergarten to second grade literacy specialist, will outline for you in a minute. Next year, our rotational curricular review will turn our focus to two things. We'll be looking at our physical education and movement program, and we'll be taking an equity audit of our entire social studies program from the 3 fours through the 13s, 14s. And then finally, under entirely new initiatives, Charlie will describe the process we are undergoing as we prepare for our new STEAM lab and that associated curriculum. But before that, Emily Shotman will describe this year's literacy review. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Shotland, the literacy specialist. So, um, one of the significant aspects for aligning curriculum, oh, thank you, um, is through our work with and in support of teachers. And while my work has really uh, focused on the uh, lower grades of the, um, the middle school and that literacy instruction. I want you to sort of, I'm going to give you a little snapshot of the work that I've been doing, but I want you to take that snapshot and sort of replicate it in your mind because this work has been happening in other ways in other divisions as Sara has spoken to about some of the work that's been happening in the upper grades. So there's really uh, three things that I'm going to be speaking towards. Um, and the first one is in terms of staffing and partnership. This is our first year of our graduate school literacy fellows program in which we've hired two um, outstanding, experienced, knowledgeable, highly trained teachers who are currently in the graduate program now in literacy to join our staff. And they have been providing, guiding, uh, been providing guided reading instruction and word study in every 6, 7s, and 7-8s seven classroom. Um, and what that has been uh, able to do is we've been able to make the reading groups actually smaller in size because we have an increased number of teachers in the classroom. And we've been able to better target the needs of the students, students in each of those groups. And uh, in terms of alignment, that's also helped in terms of the consistency and alignment, I should say. 
uh, because there are now three of us who go into every single classroom in the six sevens and seven eights providing that instruction and so we see greater consistency in that instruction which is important for students because it means no matter what classroom we're in or what grade they're in they're accessing that same rich curriculum um, the other piece is around the uh, collaboration with um, and partnerships I'm going to say with the learning specialist. So what that has translated into a few examples is my collaboration and partnership with the middle school learning specialist. She as well is also in the classroom during literacy times and it has enabled us to uh, more carefully look at the children and identify students who may benefit from support to either strengthen uh, certain areas or stretch already well-developed skills and think about ways we can support those children in school during the school day. I've also partnered uh, with the lower school learning specialist um, on a number of initiatives who has in turn <coughs> been partnering with the uh, teachers that she works with in the lower school and the fruit of all that partnering and collaborating has meant that um, uh, like a greater fluidity uh, and transition for the students as they go from the five sixes in the lower school into the six sevens uh, for the middle school. And um, one thing that we're really excited about is I think there's just been an increased sense for the children that all of them will be coming to the six sevens next year with a sense of an identity as a reader and a writer, regardless of their skill development or where they are. Um, in terms of being able to quote unquote read and write, that they all feel like readers and writers. And that really comes out of all this partnership work and it's really something that we are also doing, so yay. <laughs> um, the second piece is the internal professional development that's been happening. This year another new initiative has been the mentoring of all six, sevens, and seven, eights associate teachers and guided reading and word instruction. Uh, word study instruction and um, that has enabled them not only to be able to talk about and articulate their practices but significantly increase their instructional capacities as teachers. Um, head teachers have had bi-weekly coaching sessions, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching sessions which has enabled them to not only think about their practice but also have that nugget of time that's so hard to find as a classroom teacher to really zoom in with another set of eyes on the way one or two students may be responding to a particular type of instruction and then we zoom back out and we think about well how um, do our supports for that children really help us to think about reaching all children in that group or in the classroom which really helps us to again think about uh, both um, extending our practice and aligning our instruction. The third piece of this is the bi-weekly grade team literacy meetings that we have in which not only uh, do teachers get to um, share their practices but the conversations enable us to create a shared language around literacy which again helps us to better align our instruction and our practices and the teachers are, it also gives the teachers the opportunity to continually um, expand their toolkits and their instructional strategies. Um, the last piece of this is around um, data collection and use. So this year uh, there was a great concerted effort at the beginning of the year to collect assessment data on the literacy development of all children, the five sixes, six sevens, and seven eights. And again that was repeated mid-year and will be repeated at the end of the year. And that enabled us to um, see two things. Number one, where each and every child was in terms of their literacy development and growth. So then we could uh, use that information to place the ch students in instructional groups that were really targeting um, their growth in terms of these incremental steps. So really allowing children to grow at their pace and at their development. And the other piece is when we had all this data in front of us, we could step back and see the patterns that emerge from that data and say to ourselves, oh, well, we can see where some of our instructional strengths are and where there may be some gaps, and then immediately address those instructional gaps right in the classroom. So um, that's the work that we've been doing this year. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlie Vergara, the technology coordinator and SFC class of 95. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the STEAM initiative uh, that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math, um, as well as community development and how we're moving forward with the strategic plan. The STEAM committee was founded to support the strategic plan and is made up of three subcommittees. Um, pilot, pilot projects are new curriculum that support academic goals with new technology. In the 7s, 8s, 
students begin learning about coding by developing a handwritten coding language for simple robots. The class works over several weeks to surface a shared system for writing directions that all students can read, with the in read, write, and input into their robots. This experience is designed to provide foundation for understanding future coding languages. School visits. Uh, the school visit subcommittee looks outward, learning from the successes and challenges of other schools other schools have encountered in developing STEAM curriculum. During a recent visit to, to the Little Red Schoolhouse, we observed a fifth, fifth graders learning about evolution by playing a game invented by their teacher that uses robots to model how species change over time. Sensors and programming tools could be unlocked, giving some robots advantages when navigating a predator-filled obstacle course. The unique curriculum combined a concrete understanding of natural selection and programming to create an interactive model of a species journey across many generations. The curriculum review team is researching our own practices and identifying bright spots for C. For example, in the Force Fives, there's a focus on learning with a wide range of materials and tools. From this, we began thinking about what it would look like to extend student learning from building as an extension of imaginary play to building physical objects that help others. We're now beginning to redesign an area of the classroom to support <coughs> students in extending their dramatic play to include the iterative and empathetic components of design thinking. All right. To answer these big questions, we have to elevate and find consensus in our community's understanding of STEAM education. The academic leadership team spent a day at Columbia, first at the engineering school's makerspace and robotics lab, then at the Columbia Design Studio, learning new strategies for tackling complex systemic challenges. For families, we hosted a range of parent workshops, most recently to provide perspective on video game culture. Moving forward, we begin a monthly rotation of meetings, creating a space for parents to talk about technology in their children's home lives and sharing parenting strategies. More information on this will be sent out shortly. I really just have to think of a clever name for this whole thing. Um, everything else is set up. Um, with students, beyond learning with new technology, we're also looking at social media's impact on their social emotional development. Last week in the 12s, 13s, we talked about how students' association with games and social media content could impact their academic and social lives, as well as their worldview. Online spaces have the potential to be supportive communities, benign entertainment, or to normalize biases in which alienate peers and can stunt emotional development. It's important that students see that our goal as a school is not simply to tell them what to do or not to do online, but instead help them make more informed, thoughtful choices. Before what? Some changes are happening organically. There's far more programming and robotics across the curriculum now than when I joined Bank Street five years ago. Other challenges will be structural and demand more resources, like devoting space in the building and schedule to STEAM education. As we look externally, internally, and actively develop curriculum, consensus will begin to emerge on the best, most Bank Street path forward. Next slide depicts an architectural design of a potential STEAM lab, and this would go on the fourth floor, um, which we're still continuing to fundraise and with the hope of building in the summer of 2020. Thank you. Good morning. There are more of you than, than you know when you're sitting up here. <laughs> So I'm going to cover uh, our high school ex-missions season, and uh, really want to kind of first begin by just introducing myself. Sam Trafei Khan. I'm the head of the upper school class of '88 uh, School for Children. But also want to really just give uh, recognition to Lisa Kaki, who came in this year, hit the ground running, and really guided us through. <laughs> Lisa gave me permission to walk us through. Uh, we. You see that this is our, our largest class in, in recent time, and all 46 students have a placement this year. Yeah. Um, you'll see a star down there, that, that's likely placement. We, there could be some movement, some students are still looking at options, and so this is what the breakdown is, and some of those may shift in terms of going from public to private or private to public. Uh, but one student's going boarding, 30 students are going independent day, and 15 students are going public. Uh, and I was noting that it looks like there could be a trend toward more public, and I want to talk about um, how, that, how that has played out uh, this year. Uh, this is the breakdown of, of where school students are going in the independent day schools. Uh, 42 students applied to 44 different independent schools and received 90 acceptances. 
which is pretty astounding, and three students apply to boarding school and one is enrolling in the fall. In the public school side of things, there are basically three different types of public schools. You have the specialized, you have the selective, and then you have um, the zoned public schools. And we have students attending uh, a number of specialized and a number of selective, and we also have a student who is uh, going to be attending Hastings on the Hudson in next year. Uh, these are the notable highlights below, that 11 students qualify for seats at the eight specialized public high schools. That's where you have an entrance exam and you rank your choices. Uh, when I was a kid, maybe if you, if you grew up in New York, you remember, it was kind of Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech. You weren't allowed to choose those. You, whatever your score dictated, that's where you went. Uh, now students get a chance to choose those. So if they live in Brooklyn or they want Brooklyn Tech first, that's what, what goes no matter if they qualify for Stuyvesant or not. Uh, 19 students were offered seats at selective public schools. Uh, nine students were accepted at the 12, at 12 studios at LaGuardia, which is great. So that means certain students got multiple acceptances to uh, different studios there. And 13 students received multiple offers from public schools. This year we also saw a trend which was really interesting. A number of students who accepted at independent day schools and then chose to go to public schools after. Uh, a lot of that had to do with complications of the Board of Education saying we're going to change the date of when you have to uh, tell us to, you know, where we're going to tell you where you got into school. Uh, but it also was really, it spoke to the kind of students that we have. You know, I heard a conversation with Lisa, I was kind of eavesdropping in my office, and a student came in and said, was talking about a school that she visited, an independent school, and she said, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Like, I could see myself there. Everybody looked like me. You know, it sounded familiar. And, and so I said to Lisa afterwards, I said, she's not going there. And, and, and sure enough, she chose public. And she told us that that was too familiar. She wanted a challenge. She wanted something different. And I think it was, it spoke, she, she spoke yesterday about this on the panel, uh, the, about the diversity that she valued. She's come to value at Bank Street. And she really wants to see that at, at her next school. And she didn't want more of the same. And I thought that was really fascinating. And, uh, kind of running to the situation. Um, so these are our, our, our synopses. Is, uh, 46 students are going to matriculate to 31 high schools next year, um, which is definitely our evidence. You know, when we say we want to find the best fit school, that's what we're working towards. And, and we put up together a slide of where our current alum are located. So these are the schools, and you can see there's quite a range from Texas to <laughs> London. You know, we, those are those are hot beds for our kids. Uh, and, and everything in between. And, you know, we continue to encourage kids and families to expand their choices, to look beyond what they know, have known to be the reputation of this school or that school. And, and what we've found is that folks continually come back and say, I loved that place. Whatever it was, I had no idea we love that place. Um, but what's most, most exciting is that kids are really guiding these processes and making these choices. And that's something that can be a little jarring for families, but is super, super uh, exciting to be a part of. And we're really, really proud of, of how well they all did. So, here's your admissions. I realize there's a downside in it saying what slide out of how many there are. Um, uh, I made the executive decision to show that video, which we practiced this yesterday at fit in the amount of time, but we're going to go a little over 10 o'clock. So uh, if people need to leave at 10, that's fine, but we're going to keep going on here. So today we talked about admissions, and I'm going to talk about admissions. And, um, and I, I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple of things on this slide, uh, which is that you can see that uh, the number of applications to date for the 2019-20 admissions cycle is down um, from previous years. The 17-18 number was actually um, a bit inflated because 40 students applied from the Mandel School that year, which was a school that, that closed, and uh, so we saw a much higher uh, number of applications. But this is a, something that I learned in my site visit last week, that, that um, it's a, a citywide trend that we're seeing a declining number of applications due to some headwinds that exist, uh, including UPK, Universal Pre-Kindergarten, and so forth. Um, but this year, for next year, uh, we have 355 applications. 61% um, of those were requesting some form of financial aid. Um, we're really happy that 71 new students will be joining our community in the fall. Um, and then we have a slightly higher attrition rate from previous years. It's been 4 to 5%. We anticipate it to be about 6%. And, uh, and that's for a variety of reasons, um, ranging from the rising cost of tuition, we're seeing more families uh, feel the need to move into public schools or move out of the city. 
um, as well as uh, a number of families choosing specialized schools when they realize that their children need a type of instruction that is more targeted and specific than what Main Street um, generally provides. Um, so looking at enrollment, there's, you know, effect of this, um, this is our current enrollment for this school year on the left hand side, which is a total of 465, and our projected enrollment for next year is 451, um, and uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One is that we have a large class of uh, eighth grade students that are graduating, it's our biggest class in a while. Um, as I said before, there's, there's some attrition due to the reasons that I mentioned. And then we also are uh, slightly under-enrolled in the three fours and, and in the five sixes for next year um, relative to our target goals. So what are we doing about this? Really important question. Um, I want to just highlight some of the strategies that, are, um, that, we're, that we're undertaking as part of our relationship with a larger institution, um, but also specific to the School for Children. So first and foremost, um, I want to just say that traditionally, our, um, our marketing budget for the School for Children has been about $5,000 a year. So we've benefited from almost exclusively word of mouth and reputation. And in a competitive market, we have to do more than that. So we're working with the college to um, uh, evaluate professional marketing agencies and we're, we've done an RFP and we're actually in the next week going to be interviewing three firms that we feel can bring very professional expertise in the area of marketing and recruitment and, uh, and we'll be investing more in, in that effort moving forward. We're also examining our internal staffing structure so that we can cohere the functions of admissions, marketing, and communications. Um, we're working hard to make contacts at potential feeder organizations in academia and healthcare and uh, in technology where they tend to attract folks who come to New York City who might have young children and are looking for good schools. So establishing relationships with their HR departments to be, to be on their radar. Um, uh, we, are, we are open to exploring transportation options beyond our sort of catchment area of the Upper West Side um, to see if there are families in other parts of the city that would choose to come to us if we provided busing. And so that's a reality that we're exploring. Uh, we're excited about piloting formal parenting education opportunities, both for prospective families and current families. They can get people in the door, like you are today, to learn about all that's great at this school and also serve as a potential incubator for applications. And um, we are always refining and adapting the admissions experience as evidenced by our changes to the open house. And then I would say um, really doing a better job in terms of enrollment management with our systemic uh, collection and use of data. So for example, we'll be doing exit interviews with all of our families that are leaving this year to understand the story behind the story. Uh, we've also done a survey of all of the families that we accepted this year who didn't accept us to figure out what were the reasons that motivated them to choose another school and what maybe we could have done differently to sway them. Um, so that's important work that we're, that we're undertaking and we're still significantly up in numbers from where we were several years ago. Um, so looking at financial aid, um, I wanted to just share where we are. Uh, on the left-hand column, you'll see the total percentage of students in our uh, school that receive some form of financial aid, and that's been steadily on the increase, which is evidence of our commitment to uh, diversity. And so uh, next year, we project that 42% of our families will receive some form of aid. And then the right-hand column is actually based on this year's numbers, because it's comparison to New York City uh, independent schools, and we don't have their data for next year yet, and ours is still moving. But at the top, you'll see that um, for 2018-19, 38% of our students received some aid versus a uh, citywide average in independent schools of 24%. And then our scholarship rate, which is the, per, the number of cents on the dollar that we collect, is also higher. So, so at Bank Street, um, we are uh, collecting 76 cents on the dollar total in aggregate, whereas um, citywide it's 83 cents. The next uh, slide is about uh, uh, racial diversity, and this is based on self-reported numbers that uh, families submit as part of their application process. 
And what you'll see is um, we are among the most diverse independent schools in Manhattan, where um, this year, uh, the yellow, bright yellow column are people who self-identify as white, 54%. Um, Next year, it's actually going to be the first year where it will be majority people who identify as something other than white, so multiracial or um, in these categories, Hispanic or Latino, Asian or African American. Um, so that number, our, our ranking, which is a good thing in this regard, will move up next year um, in relation to our peer schools. So we really are true to our commitment to diversity. Um, tuition and finance, I uh, wanted to talk a bit about um, kind of the trend over the last six years in terms of tuition increases, which I know is a pain point for, for folks, and we're feeling that as well in terms of uh, what it means for people's capacity to stay here over multiple years. Um, but you'll see that in general, we've um, imposed a 5% increase on tuition year over year, fluctuated slightly. Um, and you can see also that faculty salary increases go up each year as well. Um, this is a newly negotiated contract that we were working on last year, so for next year, uh, teacher salary will go up $2,800. And then, of course, as you all know, as human beings in the world, healthcare costs are really um, escalating rapidly. So we see about a 10% increase every year. This slide is, is about um, uh, kind of the actual cost of educating a child. What you'll see on the left-hand side is that uh, we've done a very robust analysis. Some of you have heard this the finance presentation, but it actually saves the School for Children significant money um, to be part of a shared use building with the graduate school. And so because we are part of the larger Bank Street College infrastructure, it saves us about $3,200 per year uh, in, in costs that we would otherwise incur alone. So what do we put that money? We put it towards, um, towards great teachers and towards uh, our program as well as contributing to the infrastructural costs of, this, of the whole college. And even with those savings, um, we're still short in terms of, so this is from, the, from, from this year's numbers, our average uh, tuition revenue, when you, when you put together all the, the different tuition price points is $46.7 um, dollars a year. And the actual cost of educating a child at Bank Street is 50.4. And so there's a gap of $3,700 a year that we need to make up through fundraising and endowment revenue. So that leads me to my next piece, which is around importance of fundraising. And I just really want to say that there's different pathways of giving. So the annual fund is our um, most important operational um, strategy to help bridge that gap as well as to put your dollars to use immediately. And it's always our goal for 100% parent participation. We also raise money through events and related fundraising associated with those events like the auction, ticket sales for, um, for, the, for the raffle tickets and so forth. Um, endowment gifts uh, are really helpful in sort of building our long-term financial sustainability and then there's other restricted gifts which are typically like uh, class gifts that go to a specific capital improvement project as I mentioned earlier. Um, so there's good news and better news in this uh, in, in the slide that I'm about to show, but I want to just give you a sense of the historical uh, giving in the annual uh, regard. So I really want to thank Kristen for her efforts um, over one year. <laughs> you see the, the year prior to Kristen's arrival, um, we had 76% giving in the annual fund, and last year it went up 15% to 91%. That's, that's extraordinary, and I want to thank you all for your efforts in that regard. Um, and uh, so last year we raised, through for annual giving, 676000 And here's like the good and better news. So this year, as of today, we're already at 627000 um, of our goal towards 825000 and the better news is that that's only from 30% of you. Um, so what that means is that uh, the remaining 70% uh, will most certainly meet our goal of 825 by raising an additional $198,000. And we will be um, sufficiently harassing you over the next couple of months to get to that goal. Okay. Um, Vision updates. Hi, 
Hi everyone, I'm Emily Lindsay, the Lower School Division Head. In addition to what you've already heard about the Lower School, as many of you know, this year we have had the first Lower School Music teacher in 42 years. <laughs> ben Martin has navigated Ben Martin has navigated this transition so very well that singing together and making music together has maintained its core of community building in the lower school. We've enjoyed the familiarity of long-standing songs, some of which you know, uh, Rattlin' Bog and This Pretty Planet, and the freshness of new songs, including All We Really Need, Tap Your Toe, and Building a Better World. Working with classroom teachers, Ben has intertwined music with the threes, fours airplane study, the fours, fives family studies, and currently the five, sixes restaurant studies. Because this position was redesigned to include the six, sevens this year, Ben will now be another specialist that the lower school children, the five sixes going into the six sevens, will know as a bridge as they move from the lower school to the middle school. During last school year, the five sixes teaching team, along with Tal, our movement teacher, and Elizabeth, our lower school associate assistant, and I, reflected on the five sixes community building music and movement event, formerly known as the five sixes hoedown, a remnant of a, force of a former farm study. This year, Ben joined us in renaming and reframing that event as the Five Sixes Apple Fest, in keeping with the children's experiences of their apple picking trip and resulting cooking and baking work. The bottom left photo is the Apple Fest. Another part of lower school that is connected to the music program is our yearly family assembly during the week of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. This year, that assembly was renamed and reframed as Change Makers and Helpers Assembly. As our lower school year-long identity development curriculum and social justice curriculum continue to evolve, this assembly more closely ref reflected classroom experiences of learning about people, including Martin Luther King, who were, and people who are, change makers and helpers in big and small ways. It also reflected ongoing classroom work of the children seeing themselves as people who can affect change and be helpers to make life better for everyone. Last spring, the lower school faculty and children walked and sang in a march for peace, kindness, and safety. From that, we learned about the meaning that activism can have for young children, and we're exploring ways right now of having a springtime social justice action again this year. It might be a march, it might be taking other forms of action. It's looking like the theme will be environmentalism. So with giving that teaser and knowing that the end of the year isn't too far away, I hope I didn't just jinx it. <laughs> I'll just say that there's more to come. Two non-music related, non-curriculum integrated developments this year. One is the five sixes school lunch option. After a couple of months of settling in and bringing lunch from home, getting used to the school year, five, sixes children and families now have the option of signing up for school lunch from the cafeteria starting at the end of November. The lunch is brought up from the cafeteria to the second fl floor on carts so children can still eat in their classrooms with teachers and those who brought lunch from home. And two is um, another upcoming thing, end of the year transition meetings for parents. For the first time, we're offering a meeting for any threes, fours parents and fours, fives parents who want to learn more about the transition into next year's age groups. That will be on Tuesday, May 21st. And for current five sixes parents, on Tuesday, May 28th, we will have the annual meeting for the five sixes transition into middle school. That meeting is also an opportunity for five sixes parents to meet a few middle school faculty members, including Preeti, who's the head of the middle school. Hi, so this is a portion where you should be seeing our creepy, our middle school, wonderful middle school um, coordinator, but she's not able to be here today. She has a wedding in London, and she has asked me to share her highlights with you. 
um, and sensor regrets. So I'm going to start with um, an update on field trip information. Students have always benefited from going on field trips at Bank Street. Many of them have been steeped in tradition, like the Clearwater trip in the 70s. This year, thanks to the generosity of families, connections, and some new cur curriculum initiatives, we have expanded our repertoire. Some examples of new field trips this year include the United Nations and the Columbia Science Lab in the 6-7s, as well as a planned spring trip to the Malcolm Shabazz Market in Harlem in the 8-9s. We continue also to expand our toolbox for working with diverse learners. Teachers in the 7-8s spent a significant amount of time with the Universal Design for Learning approach this summer, and again within the school year. This work has offered us a critical lens into how a well-designed environment can support a range of learners. Teachers have been excited by applying these, this information to their everyday classroom life. We're also excited to report that middle school reports are now digital. The middle school has made a switch to emailing school reports directly to families this year, avoiding the need to print pages and pages of reports. While we continue to examine the best way to digitize and streamline the process, we're happy that we're making some headway and reducing our carbon fit footprint. And finally, Student voice and agency, a cornerstone of the Bank Street experience, is alive and well at Bank Street and in the middle school. We encourage and empower students to use their voices to make changes, however big or small. Because Preeti knew that I would be sharing her notes with you today, she chose as an example the changes we made this year to the 7 8 lunch routine process. This was something that I worked on with this group of children. So I'm going to give you the context in a minute. As you listen to the story, I'm going to ask you to think about these things. See if you can see how children identified what the problem was, how they used what they know about the world to come up with solutions, how they created a plan of action, how they launched that plan of action, and then their reflections on the results. So the context is, um, in the 7 eights, the schedule has um, unfolded in such a way that they have the earliest recess and lunch, and they're back-to-back, -back, and they're 30-minute sessions. So children within, well, the other context for those of you that are new to our school is that um, recess for the 7 eights happens on the roof, which is equivalent to the 10th floor, and lunch happens in our cafeteria at the basement. A big difference when they have to get there with no, not much transition time in the middle. So by, I would say, the second week of school, children in the 7 eights started, complain, started complaining to anyone that would listen to them that there was not enough time for playing and eating. They were rushing to get to the roof, playing fast, and rushing to get to lunch, and then still not having enough time to eat. In typical Bank Street fashion, we asked the children what they thought we should do about this. While many of them were very happy to engage with me in a range of problem-solving strategies, one child said to me in frustration, why can't you just fix this? Aren't you and Jed in charge of the school? <laughs> it did seem like they had somewhat of a point. So we started with an uncharacteristic adult intervention and arranged for an, ex arranged for an express elevator to pick the 7 eights up each day from the ninth floor at the end of recess and take them directly down to lunch. Less wait time during the transition, one problem solved. Several others still needed to be tackled. In order to learn more about their concerns, I joined the community meetings in each of the 7 eights classrooms. I asked students what else they were noticing. They shared with me, kids keep getting up from their chairs to get water and forks and spoons at the other side of the cafeteria. On the way back from getting water, kids decide to stop and talk to their friends in other classes at other tables. Because we don't get to see each other much, we keep talking, and then we don't have enough time to eat. <laughs> all of this also makes the cafeteria really noisy. Now, this was a summary that was consistent in all three rooms. Children had some ideas about what we could do based on their experiences in restaurants, and apparently also on picnics. We decided to get pitchers for water and caddies for utensils, cups, and napkins for each of the cafeteria tables. They thought if children stayed at their tables, they would eat more of their lunch. They also suggested that if this new routine worked, teachers should let them have lunch dates with the kids from other classes in the empty tables in the middle of the cafeteria. They thought this would be a good reward for fixing this problem. <laughs> with this settled, we got busy. Children voted on what would go in each section of the caddy. They all made the associated labels to indicate what went where. They made plans for how we'd manage the jobs of putting out the pictures at the beginning of lunch and putting it away at the end. We set up the shelf that would now live in the cafeteria with our new materials, and we picked a date for when we launched the new rotation of our lunch plan. While I was sitting in the cafeteria with the 7 eights at lunch, one day before we tried these solutions, a child said to me with a worried voice, I don't think there's going to be enough room on the table for our lunch, our lunch boxes, and the pitcher and the caddy. They told me they had a solution. 
they notice that when they go to a restaurant, sometimes women hang their bags on hooks that are on the side of the table or by the bar. They thought we needed hooks just like those for their lunch boxes. I hated to shoot down good problem solving, but I was pretty sure we were not going to be drilling holes into the walls or tables for hooks. So I suggested that we just try the system without hooks and see what we noticed. Undeterred, they persisted. <laughs> I decided to leave them in another possible solution. I asked them if they remembered what we did in the lower school with lunchboxes at lunchtime. We put their lunchboxes under their chair while they were eating. They asked me incredulously, have you seen the floors? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Another time, we might not be able to get hooks on the table, but maybe we could find a hook for the back of a chair. Some agreed that this was a good compromise. Others worried that the hook on the chair solution would be too uncomfortable. We finally agreed to launch our plan without the hooks, see what was happening. Sure enough, in the end, everything fit on the table, no need for hooks. They were deeply disappointed. I was very relieved. During the first few weeks of our new lunch routine, children regularly called me over to excitedly say, our ideas are working, kids are eating, and it's not so noisy. It's been a few months now. When the novelty held them, there was a noticeable calm in the cafeteria during the 7 8 lunch. Now, on occasion, they might benefit from gentle reminders. And still, in general, lunch is better, than it was before we'd made these changes. And at least once each, sorry, once each lunchtime that I'm on duty, a child will remind me that their ideas are still working. Three weeks ago, when I, called over, I was called over to a table what, which, for what I thought was going to be another mutual pat on the back about how good our work had been, a child said to me instead, now that these caddies are at our tables, I'm noticing how much plastic we are using. Look at this, plastic spoons, plastic forks, plastic cups. This is not good. It is bad for the environment. environment. We have to do something about this. And so there it was. This 7 8 had identified where the next change making was needed. Mm -hmm. Alright, it's me again. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the upper school. Uh, as Koi mentioned, we started a GSA, which at Bank Street is the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. This is really, really exciting for a lot of reasons. And, and one is that uh, being student-led, we imagine that this is going to be much more long-lasting than if we had implemented it. GSAs in middle schools are always tricky because kids don't necessarily know where they are. So we did a lot of research on how GSAs are uh, formed. We reached out to Glisten, we downloaded packets that are called How to Start a GSA in Your School, and the kids came up with a, bi a model that was kind of a, a, a bilateral model, if you will, where on certain days, kids who already identify as part of the LGBTQ community can meet, and those who are curious about what the work that uh, the GSA is doing can meet on the other weeks. Uh, and so it's been really, really interesting so far. They've brought things to our attention, like National Day of Silence, and our, our kind of excited about branching out and connecting with other schools as well to expand their work. Very, very excited about our sports season this year. We joined a league, the AIPSL, which is the American International Private Schools League. Uh, we were on probation this year, and so once we are done exhibiting our exemplary behavior, we will be qualified for postseason play. So next year, our undefeated volleyball team can take home a championship. Yeah. And, uh, pretty, pretty uh, all the other teams are going to follow, of course, and that's, that's just enough. Um, Upper School Assembly was, was super, super exciting this year. And, uh, I could talk about this forever, and hopefully you may have seen my blog post that went up yesterday. We've brought in such a range of people, from student performers who are already here, to uh, alum, to friends of, of, of mine, or people that we are connected with. And I'll just highlight a couple of things that, uh, that you see on the screen. One is um, you see Elsa dancing in the middle, and that was the first time we had a student perform uh, a creative dance that they work on outside of school, even though we have a ton of dancers, none of them have ever braved the stage and offered that uh, to us. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Uh, in the bottom left, we had Jason Samuel Smith, who is a world-renowned tap dancer, and those of you who are in the same age range remember bringing the noise, bringing the funk, and he was an understudy for uh, Savion Glover. And so he talked about learning from Gregory Hines and the Masters, and uh, it was just so super, super moving. And then he had a dance battle, which he called a conversation, with a fifth grader who was in the front row tapping his feet the whole time. And he said, why don't you come up and dance with me? And it was, it was really, really awesome. And, uh, and lastly, it was uh, a friend of mine, Ben Selkow, who's a, a director and producer of films, and he just released 
uh, last summer, Netflix, uh, the, the series is called Rapture, it's about uh, hip hop, which the kids went crazy for when he said, I followed two chains around, they were like, two chains, and I know those are your favorite rappers. <laughs> He was really cool. He showed, talked about Nas and talked about Logic, and uh, the kids were just blown away. So Assembly continues to be uh, an amazing part of our program. And I, and I want to point out one last thing, which is the top middle. That's uh, Julian in, in the blue shirt. And Julian and Alexander are two 12s, 13s who have really, really given me hours back of my own life. We meet on Tuesdays to plan out assemblies, so it doesn't happen at my house in the evening. And uh, it's been amazing. Those two are just filled with life. They love this program and take a lot of pride in making sure that it, it comes to life the way that we want it to. Uh, and then we have community time, and so our community time has been a, a year-long exploration. I just sat with a, a school, we went to a, a presentation by Hackley School, who are doing the same thing. They're expanding their advisory program in middle school. They said they're on year five of expanding their program and trying to figure out what it is that it's going to become. And it gave me a little bit of um, kind of comfort to know how long that process is taking. You know, ours is moving quickly, but this is a really, really long process, and I think Laura's slides about how uh, thoughtful you have to be around creating and implementing curriculum speaks to that. Uh, but this year we focused on relationships and communication, so we did everything from how to do it, uh, effective text messaging, to we had a recent conversation about memes, um, to anything about you know dealing with your peers, your families, uh, and, and also the social life outside of school as you get a little bit older, hopefully. Um, and so it's been a really, really cool year in, in community time exploration. I think there's going to be a lot more progress next year, but it'll give us some clarity that we can point to and say, here's what we, what we focus on when it comes to social emotional health. Uh, and my last, I don't have a slide for this, but I, I have to plug this, and I know it's late, but Allie McCursey is leading an amazing, amazing curriculum, and it was highlighted last night, and so I said, if I was highlighted last night by a student, I should definitely say it. Uh, we've connected with a school in Madison, Virginia, and are doing Skype conversations with this school. Last year, we did it with a school in the Shenandoah Valley, and uh, it was just conversations. You know, they did something where they said, you know, raise your hand if you grew up around guns, and everybody on the screen side raised their hand, and everybody on our side had not. And so the question is, how do you have a conversation about gun control if you didn't grow up the, uh, with guns in your household? And so the kids then this year said, we'd like to take that to another level. We want to work on projects together. And so they're in partnerships or in threesomes where they're tackling things like gun control or things like the environment and then presenting out to the rest of their classmates. And it's been an unbelievable experience where I've seen some of the text exchanges that they've um, had on over Google Drive, uh, where they've made connections about their family lives, you know, about loss of parents or uh, about the work that they've uh, been inspired by. So it's been truly, truly unbelievable. Uh, and Ali made me plug it. The board of Virginia School Board has recognized that as a moving curriculum that they are going to put financial dollars behind. This is something that they have to present, uh, and I can share out the link so that you can see that, but it's pretty, pretty exciting to see it online. So that's why I did. Okay, promise we're almost at the end. Um, so really, to wrap up, um, see what happens when you share the stage with all these people. <laughs> we go over our time, but uh, thank you for, for hanging in there with us. Just wanted to, um, it's always fun to talk about what the arts-based residencies are each year. Um, for those of you who don't know, beginning in the 9th, 10th, or 4th grade, and all the way through to the 12th, 13th, there's a period during the year where we have a visiting artist or group that spends time with our students. So this year, uh, the Dorothy Carter Writer in Residence, who is working with our 9s, 10s, and they'll have their share next week, is Emma Otegi, who's a really accomplished author. Um, three out of the last five um, Dorothy Carter writers have gone on to win a Newbery Prize, so she's in very good company. Um, we are excited that the, that the uh, Performing Arts Based Residency, which is named after Alex Cohen, uh, a former student here, is the Ajna Dance Company, which is an Indian dance troupe who will be coming and performing for the upper school as well as then, uh, actually for, for, for both lower and upper school as well as um, spending time in the 10s, 11s, um, learning about dance. The 11s, 12s do a visual arts-based residency, and this year it was Leah Cook, who's one of our own teachers, who's also a, a very accomplished potter, and she did a faculty meeting and has been working with the 11s, 12s to create sculpture out of clay. 
And then one of the highlights of the Bank Street program is always when the 12s, 13s spend a lot of time with a very accomplished poet named Advocate of Words, and then culminating with uh, a performance at the Eureka Poets Cafe in the Lord's side. <laughs> Couple final points. This year, we also went through an accreditation process, and um, so it was our five year, which is a little bit lighter touch. It's a two day visit versus a four day visit, and we received unconditional um, positive review from our visiting team with no findings that will uh, require us to do um, any kind of corrective action, which could be the consequence. Uh, uh, Javid mentioned that his blog post went up yesterday. What Laura just read will soon be posted. Um, we're really excited that we launched something called a view with a view. Um, the name means something, which is that we take the view of something and go inside of that and then also sort of extrapolate the view, what that means in terms of our beliefs about progressive education. It's part of our efforts to tell our story. And, um, and so there have been five blog posts from members of the leadership team. You should read it, you should spread the word, share it with your friends. Um, it's a great way to, to, to learn about Bank Street. We're also grateful to the Parents Association um, and Jeremy in particular, who's an who's a, uh, expert um, podcast person. And we, yesterday was also, the or earlier this week was the release of the second Bank Street Studies podcast. The first one focused on our math program. The next one talks about uh, our approach to diversity, equity, and social justice, featuring Koi. There will be another one upcoming about the new teacher mentoring program at some point. And so uh, it's also another way for us to get our magic out to the world. Uh, looking ahead, I just want to say that um, you should know by now that, that next year we're starting a little earlier, which was a Herculean task um, to get approved, but we're really excited that uh, very, very excited about our sports season this year. We joined a league, the AIPSL, which is the American International Private Schools League. Uh, we are on probation this year, and so once we are done exhibiting our exemplary behavior, we will be qualified for postseason play. So next year, our undefeated volleyball team can take home a championship. Uh, that's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, and all the other teams are going to follow, of course. That's that's just a good. Um, Upper School Assembly was, was super, super exciting this year, and uh, I could talk about this forever, and hopefully you may have seen my blog post that went up yesterday. We've brought in such a range of people, from student performers who are already here, to uh, alum, uh, to friends of, of, of mine, or people that we are connected with. And I'll just highlight a couple of things that, uh, that are, you see on the screen. One is um, you see Elsa dancing in the middle, and that was the first time we had a student perform uh, a creative dance that they work on outside of school. Even though we have a ton of dancers, none of them have ever braved the stage and offered that uh, to us. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Uh, in the bottom left, we had Jason Samuel Smith, who is a world-renowned tap dancer. And those of you who are in the same age range remember bringing the noise, bringing the funk, and he was an understudy for uh, Savion Glover. And so he talked about learning from Gregory Hines and the Masters, and uh, it was just super, super, super moving. And then he had a dance battle, which he called a conversation, with a fifth grader who was in the front row tapping his feet the whole time. And he said, why don't you come up and dance with me? And it was, it was really, really awesome. And, uh, and lastly, it was a friend of mine, Ben Selkow, who is a, a director and producer of films, and he just released uh, last summer Netflix, uh, the, the series is called Rapture. It's about uh, hip hop, which the kids went crazy for when he said, I followed two chains around. They were like, two chains. And I know those are your favorite rappers. <laughs> and he, was, uh, he, he was really cool. We showed, talked about Nas and talked about Logic, and uh, the kids were just blown away. So Assembly continues to be uh, an amazing part of our program. And I, and I want to point out one last thing, which is the top middle. That's uh, Julian in, in the blue shirt. And Julian and Alexander are two 12s, 13s who have really, really given me hours back on my own life. We meet on Tuesdays to plan out assemblies, so it doesn't happen at my house in the evening. And uh, it's been amazing. Those two are just filled with life. They love this program and take a lot of pride in making sure that it, it comes to life the way that we want it to. Uh, and then we have community time. And so our community time has been a, a year long exploration. I just sat with a, a school. We went to a, a presentation by Hackley School who are doing the same thing. They're expanding their advisory program in the middle school. They said they're on year five of expanding their program and trying to figure out what it is that it's going to become. And it gave me a little bit of um, kind of comfort to know how long that process is taking. You know, ours is moving quickly, but this is a really, really long process. And I think Laura's slides about how 
uh, thoughtful you have to be around creating and implementing curriculum speaks to that. Uh, but this year we focused on relationships and communication. So we did everything from how to do it, uh, effective text messaging to we had a recent conversation about memes um, to anything about you know dealing with your peers, your families, uh, and, and also the social life outside of school as you get a little bit older, hopefully. Um, and so it's been a really, really cool year in, in community time exploration. I think there's gonna be a lot more progress next year, but it'll give us some clarity that we can point to and say, here's what we, what we focus on when it comes to social emotional health. Uh, and my last, I don't have a slide for this, but I, I have to plug this and I know it's late, but Allie McCursey is leading an amazing, amazing curriculum and it was highlighted last night. And so I said, if I was highlighted last night by a student, I should definitely say it. Uh, we've connected with a school in Madison, Virginia and are doing Skype conversations with this school. Last year we did it with a school in the Shenandoah Valley and uh, it was just conversations. You know, they did something where they said, you know, raise your hand if you grew up around guns and everybody on the screen side raised their hand and everybody on our side had not. And so the question is, how do you have a conversation about gun control if you didn't grow up the, um, with guns in your household? And so the kids then this year said, we'd like to take that to another level. We wanna work on projects together. And so they're in partnerships or in, in threesomes where they're tackling things like gun control or things like the environment and then presenting out to the rest of their classmates. And it's been an unbelievable experience where I've seen some of the text exchanges that they've um, had on over Google Drive, uh, where they've made connections about their family lives, you know, about loss of parents or uh, about the work that they've uh, been inspired by. So it's been truly, truly unbelievable. Uh, and Ali made me plug it. The board of Virginia School Board has recognized that as a moving curriculum that they're gonna put financial dollars behind. This is something that they have to present, uh, and I can share out the link so that you can see that, but it's pretty, pretty exciting to see it online. So that's why I did. Okay, promise we're almost at the end. Um, so really, to wrap up, um, see what happens when you share the stage with all these people. We go over our time, but uh, thank you for, for hanging in there with us. Just wanted to, um, it's always fun to talk about what the arts based residencies are each year. Um, for those of you who don't know, beginning in the 9s, 10s, our fourth grade, and all the way through to the 12s, 13s, there's a period during the year where we have a visiting artist or group that spends time with our students. So this year, uh, the Dorothy Carter Writer in Residence, who is working with our 9s, 10s, and they'll have their share in the next week, is Emma Otegi, who's a really accomplished author. Um, three out of the last five um, Dorothy Carter writers have gone on to win a Newbery Prize, so she's in very good company. Um, we are excited that the, that the uh, Performing Arts Based Residency, which is named after Alex Cohen, a uh, former student here, is the Ajna Dance Company, which is an Indian dance troupe who will be coming and performing for the upper school as well as then, uh, actually for, for, for both lower and upper school as well as um, spending time in the tens, elevens, um, learning about dance. The elevens, twelves do a visual arts-based residency, and this year it was Leah Cook, who's one of our own teachers, who's also a, a very accomplished potter, and she did a faculty meeting and has been working with the elevens, twelves to create sculpture out of clay. And then one of the highlights of the Bank Street program is always when the twelves, thirteens spend a lot of time with a very accomplished poet named Advocate of Words and then culminating with uh, a performance at the Mia Weekend Poets Cafe in the Lower East Side. <coughs> Couple final points. This year, we also went through an accreditation process, and um, so it was our five year, which is a little bit lighter touch. It's a two day visit versus a four day visit, and we received unconditional um, positive review from our visiting team with no findings that will uh, require us to do um, any kind of corrective action, which could be the consequence. Uh, uh, Javed mentioned that his blog post went up yesterday. What Laura just read will soon be posted. Um, we're really excited that we launched something called A View with a View. Um, the name means something, which is that we take the view of something and go inside of that and then also sort of extrapolate the view, what that means in terms of our beliefs about progressive education. It's part of our efforts to tell our story. And, um, and so, there have been five blog posts from members of the leadership team. You should read it, you should spread the word, share it with your friends. Um, it's a great way to, to, to learn about Bank Street. We're also grateful to the Parents Association, um, and Jeremy in particular, who's a, who's a uh, 
expert um, podcast person. And we've yesterday it was also the or earlier this week was the release of the second Bank Street Studies podcast. The first one focused on our math program. The next one talks about uh, our approach to diversity, equity, and social justice, featuring Koi. There will be another one upcoming about the new teacher mentoring program at some point. And so uh, it's also another way for us to get our magic out into the world. Uh, looking ahead, I just want to say that um, you should know by now that, that next year we're starting a little earlier, which was a Herculean task um, to get approved. But we're really excited that uh, because Labor Day is it, uh, where it is again this year, we really wanted to start school sooner. You don't have that extra week in the summer this year, um, which hopefully we'll appreciate. And then, um, uh, as parents, and then, and then, just as a sort of looking ahead, um, we've already updated our website, and really proud of that. But we also are moving towards the uh, adoption of a new ERP, which is Enterprise Resource Platform, um, which is our sort of comprehensive da database that coheres all of our systems from admissions to uh, to financial aid to um, to student management, and uh, and so Blackboard, which is kind of the gold standard in independent schools, is the is the platform that we have chosen. So in 2020, you're going to see a whole revised parent portal and opportunities to engage in a simple click with information that pertains to your child. Um, this was the least progressive hour and 40 minutes in the sense that you all were sitting here quietly and grac graciously, and uh, we really wanted to thank you for that. Just last thing, um, this is always fun facts. Two thirds of our teachers have graduate degrees from the, from the school, from the college. Uh, 20 faculty members now either send their children to the School for Children or the Family Center. We have six faculty members who were themselves alumni of the school, and you heard from two of them today, Charlie and, and Javed, and then 14 current parents and counting, some of you in the room actually attended the school as children. Uh, so that is fun. And then my final plug is that if you love Bank Street so much that the thought of having 10 weeks in the summer without it is, uh, is sad for you, um, summer camp is an option. So from uh, June 17th all the way through August 30th, we have a really fun, robust uh, summer camp program. You've probably seen Cookie and Dylan and Ife. Um, we are happy to have your children and please spread the word to your friends and neighbors about um, the, the wonderful opportunities that the summer camp provides. Thank you all so much for being here.